In this video, I'm going to take a look at the math coprocessor that will be part of my 286 build. In the basic system configuration diagram, you can see in the lower left there is a processor extension, which is optional. That is the 287 math coprocessor that I'll be using in this system. Similar to the previous video where I talked about the interrupt controller, in this video, I'm going to focus on the math coprocessor and the actual how I'm going to connect it to my system, the design or the plan for that. Uh, later, I'll actually connect it, wire it up on the breadboard, and then further after that, then I'll actually get to figuring out how to work with it from an assembly perspective. And you'll see that there's some similarities. Uh, I, can, I can program basically or modify the behavior of the 287 coprocessor. Uh, by writing to an address uh, of it through an I.O. port, uh, much like we, we did or we saw in the last video uh, with the interrupt controller. And I have plenty of questions. I don't have a full understanding of everything here yet, but I think I'm getting some comfort for how it's going to connect up at least. And like I said, the assembly part I'll have work to do later. If I look at the breadboard build that I have so far. This math coprocessor is going to sit here in the lower left. Um, so this is the chip I'm going to be using. And it is an Intel chip. And I actually took a picture of the top of the chip if, uh, if you want to know specifically what I'm using. So it's a D80287-10. And the data sheets for this are hard to find. And, and actually the, you've as I search, I find the same data sheet over and over, and the quality of the data sheet is quite poor. Um, so not seeing a lot of real good data sheets as I look around. Because that is hard to read, I did put in just some additional labels here to make that a little bit more readable. And here is the table of the different pins, what the pins are and what their function uh, would be. Some of this is pretty straightforward, like the clock. So we're going to run the clock into this. CKM is a clock mode signal. Basically, am I going to take that clock at full speed, or am I going to divide it by three and use a third of, of the clock speed? In my case, I'm going to go ahead and pull that high so that I'm just going to use the full clock speed. I'm not going for any high speed records here with this build, so I don't think I'm going to exceed the clock speed of this processor, which I'm going to guess is a 10 megahertz uh, capable 287 coprocessor because of the dash 10. In the last video, I mentioned that my interrupt controller is actually going to be the bottleneck at this point of the chips I have so far. It's a slower version of that chip. And I'm going to get a faster version later. But for now, that is the slow part of my system, I think, uh, outside of maybe ROM or RAM. Uh, there's a reset signal, there's data lines, uh, there's going to be data communication. We're going to send data to the 287 coprocessor, and of course we're going to pull data back. Obviously all the calculations that it's doing, but also setting configuration and things like that, much like the interrupt controller in the last video. Uh, the 287 can indicate that it's busy, it can indicate an error, uh, it can also uh, do this uh, PEREQ, which is a processor extension data channel operand transfer request. Uh, that's a mouthful, uh, but basically indicates that the 287 is ready to transfer data. And then there's also an input of an acknowledgement that would be coming back from the processor, you know, acknowledges that the request has been recognized. Then we have this NPRD, NPWR. So the first one is a numeric processor read. And interestingly, this data sheet on the next one says the same thing. Uh, that's a typo. It's got to be a typo because to the left, it's a WR. So the, to me, that's a write. So we've got an input signal saying we're going to read. We've got an input signal saying that we're going to write. Uh, and again, that's just like the interrupt controller last time. There were those same types of inputs, a read or a write. And then there are two different signals to select the chip. So NPS1 has to be low and NPS2 has to be high. Both of those have to be set that way for this chip to be enabled if I'm going to write or read from it as an I.O. device. And then we have uh, command lines. And this looks like it's similar to the interrupt controller in the last video where I'm going to set up 
uh, an address to decode that will basically enable this chip. And then when it's enabled, I can access different uh, parts within it or different uh, registers or ports, uh, however it is uh, properly referenced here on this chip, by setting different values for command 0 and command 1. And that'll probably make more sense when I show you uh, the diagram here coming up. Uh, so that's it for pins. And as far as connectivity, this next diagram comes out of that data sheet. And if you take a look at this, you've got the bus controller over to the far left. I've previously talked about that. We've got the clock generator. I've talked about that. We've got the processor, of course. And uh, I've mentioned transceivers in the past uh, as far as the data transceivers are concerned. And usually there's some address latching somewhere. And then here is our 8287. And so then we've got this 74 AS138, which is basically just a three line to eight line decoder or demultiplexer. Uh, and basically that allows me uh, to have a table that maybe looks like this. And so this is, so this I pulled it for the 74 S138, but the AS138 is not gonna be any different. Uh, and what you're going to see here is that there are these select lines on it, A, B, and C, which you've got over here, A, B, and C. There's some enables, uh, G2A plus G2B equals G2. So down, when we get down here, you'll just see it say G2. But I can see I've got G2B, I've got G2A, I've got G1. Uh, so I've got okay, A, B, C, G2, G1. Now that's giving me all of these inputs and I read this diagram as we're gonna look at output seven. So this is the output column I wanna look at. And really, ultimately, we've gotta get down to the 287 and we're gonna pull this enable high, which it needs to be high. This one needs to be pulled low. So ultimately, we need to get a low signal down to NPS one. Um, so if I'm looking at this table, it kind of just tells me that uh, this is what we're we're trying to get out of that to tell me that this chip is enabled as a low. And uh, this indicator also tells me this is an active low coming out of that pin, not an inverter, the way I understand how to read this. And as I'm going through any of this, if I'm mistaken, uh, do let me know, please. Uh, so we have this uh, decoder. It's going to take in some values for A, B, C, G2, G1. And all of that then is going to hopefully end up giving me a low signal that turns on this chip under certain conditions. So what I was trying to figure out is, okay, under what conditions, based on this diagram at least, would this 287 actually get enabled so that we could write a command or a configuration to it? So I, I walked through that, and I'm just going to kind of walk you through what I was looking at uh, if, if you're interested in this kind of stuff. You can see up top, I've got a whole bunch of address lines. So address 5, 4, 3, 7, 6, 15, 14, all the way down to 8, address 0, address 2, address 1. And as I look at that, address 0 and all of these addresses to the left, those are all going into some type of input to get to that 138 that's gonna ultimately help me select this low if the right combination is set. And then this address one and two, if I follow those down, they're gonna come into this command one and command zero of the 287. Okay, so what is that decode logic looking like it's doing? Well, first of all, we've got some NOR gates. There are three input NOR gates and I'm gonna assume that coming out of that, we want a high, which means we want all zeros coming in. Uh, and the reason I say that is we have a NAND gate, and if I look at that NAND gate, it's a one, two, three, four, five input NAND gate. And assumption is those all are supposed to be high for it to then kick out a low, and G2A then would go low. And if I come back down to this table down here, I'm looking for both G to A and B together to be low, so that would give me my low. And I'll come back over to the B here in a little bit. So I've got all zeros coming into A15 down to A8 and also A0. That's gonna give me my ones coming out of those three. But I'm also gonna need ones for these uh, address seven and address six. Okay, so let's assume that they're a one. So I'm gonna assume seven is a one, six is a one, all of these are zeros so far. 
that will get me to a zero coming out of this NAND gate. I'm also going to assume that address 5, 4, and 3 are all ones, because uh, again, if I come down and look at this function table, A, B, and C, they all need to be high or ones. Okay, that is uh, starting to paint the picture for me. If I look at this other G2 signal, which we need to see a low, where is it coming from? And I can follow it back and see that that is MIO. The IO was the low active or active low, so that tells me that I have to be doing an IO instruction or IO in my bus cycle for this to come low. So if I'm doing IO and all of these things up here are ones, that'll give me a zero here, those two zeros are setting my G2 to low down here. G1 needs to be a one, that needs to be high according to this table as I'm kind of reverse thinking this and if I take G1 and follow it backwards that is my uh, int A uh, so it's COD int A well if I look at uh, COD int A and I want to understand that a little bit better I could add up this table which we've looked at in previous videos so I'm saying that okay COD int A needs to be high well, that filters it down to this block and then I know that MIO needs to be low. That further filters it down to these. And I can see that two of these aren't valid. So really what I'm left with is I'm either doing an IO read or an IO write. And if I tally up you know, all of these input ones and zeros as I'm, I'm kind of looking at this, uh, what I'm going to find is that I'm going to get to where that tells me that the address that this is being basically activated on uh, is going to look like this and it's going to be a one 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 don't care what the next two are zero and uh, so let's just assume that that's a zero zero but that gives me the first address of F8 and then the next even is an FA, FC and FE so it looks like I've got four even addresses that I can use in the range of F8 through you know, the last one and it would be, actually be FF if this last bit was a one. I then I'm gonna have to put up, if I'm gonna mimic this, which is maybe how I'll start, I'm gonna try to target F8 as the IO address for this device. I don't know if it needs to be at F8, I'm sure it could be at any address that I wanna decode and use, but uh, this is what this diagram's showing and I might uh, just mimic that in my logic. And I'll show you that here momentarily. Okay, so I said a lot there. Uh, hopefully that made sense, but basically I just took the diagram that was in the data sheet, kind of just backed up everything and said, well, if I was gonna get down to the point where this was actually pulled low down here to enable it, what would have had to be true? And that's what I just walked through. Uh, as far as then wiring up my coprocessor, this is what that looks like. You can see I've got the clock coming in. Uh, I've mentioned in a previous video that uh, Intel recommends uh, a small resistor in line here with the clock, so I've got that in there. I'm going to pull the CKM high so that I just use the, the full clock speed on this. I've got reset, NPRD, I'm going to just pull from this IORC and IOWC, that comes back to that bus controller. I'm going to pull NPS2, which is an active high, high. And then NPS1 is an active low, and I'm going to pull that low using my PSOC. And I'll show you the logic I put in the, into the PSOC to do my address decode for this. Then I've got this PEACK, uh, PEREQ, busy error, and all the data lines. And you're going to see that stuff all just connects right to the processor. So here's my processor. I've got my PEACK. Here's my error line. I've got my PEREQ line. And let's see, what am I missing then? Busy line right there. Of course, I've got all the data lines here. We've got the clock coming from my clock generator card. Uh, we've got the reset also coming from that card. Well, not that card, that chip, I should say. Uh, these were coming from that other bus controller chip. 
So most of this is a pretty straightforward uh, set of connections, really. And as I mentioned, I updated PSOC, and I am now bringing in some additional addresses. And let's see, I think I had to add A4 through A7 as inputs into my PSOC so that I could do some address decoding based on that. And then I now have an enable coming out. And every time I try to type math, I type match. So this should say math co-enable. So I'll have to fix that. And then I also have an LED uh, indicator just when that is enabled, which is an, an active low. Uh, give me out an active high for an LED to turn an LED on. As far as the logic I'm putting in the PSOC to support this, uh, what I've added here, that A765, in the last video I had used some of these lower address lines to properly do the address decode for the IRQ controller. So I was using address 4, 3, 2, and 1. Uh, well, now I need to use 76543. So I already had 4 and 3 up here, so I could use those. So I added these additional 3. And here's the logic that I have. I'm basically saying I want address 7 to be a 1, 6 to be a 1, 5, 4, 3, all to be a 1. And then if I do that, that's going to give me this F8 address. Um, I'm going to assume I'm not writing to any I.O. addresses higher than a 7 with a 1 in it. And if I do, I'll come back and, and update this logic. But for now, that's fine. So I'm using A0 through A7 to set my addressing. Uh, but this should give me, you know, if I pull up a calculator and put in five ones followed by three zeros, that should give me my F8. I suppose I could check that here real quickly. So I'll just go to binary, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then A2, A1, A0. And so that is the address of F8. And if I was to fill the rest of this in, of course, that would get me to FF. So the range I think that we're looking at here is uh, going from F8 to FF for enabling this math coprocessor. Like I mentioned before, I know I have a lot of assembly work to do, so that is something on my list, uh, just like the interrupt controller. So last time I showed this same list, uh, and we'll see uh, what I, I pick up with next. I think I'm still hopeful that this uh, CPU hat will come in soon, uh, the new CPU board and hat, and then I'll get into wiring. So those are the two things I hope that are coming in for upcoming videos, but we still might be a, a week or two away from that. If you've got any feedback on this, if there's anything I, as I was going through that decoding logic, if I wasn't catching that quite right, or there's something else that you have for suggestions or questions, uh, do please let me know. Mm -hmm.